Hey everyone, I'm Adrian. I'm the founder of The Proof, and I'm here today with my friend Steph. Hey guys, I'm Steph. I'm the founder of Levitate Foundry. And we're here today with Allie and Peter from Robin Golf, uh, good friends of ours. So just to kick off, if you want to give us a round, um, rundown sorry, of each of your backgrounds, and then lead into kind of what pushed you to launch the brand. Yeah, hey guys, uh, I'm Peter Marler. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Robin. Uh, prior to this, let's see, I was an OG uh, employee at Facebook. I started there around 2008, back when it was only a website for college students. Uh, stayed, there, stayed there till about 2013, uh, went off to business school at Stanford in 2014. Uh, after that, did a few years in corporate strategy at NBC Universal and started Robin in 2018 with Allie. Hi guys, I am Allie Marler, Peter's sister-in-law, co-founder and CMO of Robin Golf. I joined Peter on the Facebook, Instagram bandwagon about eight years ago now and have been at the company ever since. So we started this together about two years ago and now I'm doing two jobs. I love it. Um, yeah, so rewind two years ago. Uh, just walk us through the early days from you know early conversations around the idea up to execution and launch and then we can go from there yeah al do you want to talk a little bit about how uh, it was a personal it was a personal experience that got us started with robin it wasn't really our intention or even ambition to start a golf equipment company but it really came out of a personal experience al you want to uh, give the rundown yeah the, the fun story so uh my husband and i andrew who is our third co-founder moved to la about four years ago he is a scratch golfer absolutely loves the game. And his one ask of Peter and I was to get into the sport. So he mistakenly now, but hindsight is 2020, sent us to get our own golf clubs without him. So Peter and I walked into a local golf store in Los Angeles thinking it was going to be easy to buy clubs. Little did we know it was one of the harder experiences we were going to have. Um, Peter was just met with a ton of choices. The prices were astronomical considering we didn't even know if we'd want to play golf long term. I was sent to the back of the store and there were about three options, all which were pink and purple and had names like the Azalea and the Delilah, which felt very sexist to me. So we really walked out of there thinking, nope, there's got to be a better way to which we found there wasn't at the time. So we put a lot of research in, talked to a bunch of people and decided that if there wasn't a product on the market for us, it was up to us to go build it. So that's a little of that Facebook culture they imprinted in our brains early on. So we really set out to understand, you know, what was the product market fit? Was this a problem other people were facing? And can we actually build our own set of clubs that fit our needs? And so we spent a lot of time going through that. We luckily found someone very experienced in the golf industry to help us build the set of clubs because we found that making your own clubs in China with the language and the time barrier was much harder than we initially thought. And so that really led us to get our first product. We did a Kickstarter for a product market fit and then realized, hey, this is something that's going to work and set out to build a, you know, a V2 of the product, took a lot of feedback. And then we are sitting here with you today, almost officially a year post product launch, which was last March in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm curious specifically around the Kickstarter um, when you mentioned kind of product market fit and validating that. Um, like if you can go into more details about that, like what specific data points or feedback from customers that you got that you kind of knew early on that you were onto something and then that pushed you into kind of where you are now. Pete, take it away. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the Kickstarter was more of a way for us to gather feedback on the product rather than a way to raise money. We'd actually sort of parallel path the Kickstarter with, uh, also raising a, like a small friends and family round. Uh, so the Kickstarter, we knew we were onto something. We'd set a goal of thirty thousand dollars. We exceeded that, in, you know, ahead of the sort of one month time period. Uh, some of the valuable data that we got was around mostly just the, the technology of the club. So people would tell us um, we were selling individual clubs at the time through the Kickstarter. Now we only sell sets, um, but people would tell would tell us sort of what they liked, what they didn't like about the clubs, how they felt. Um, the reactions they got from, you know, people on the course, how they played, uh, the performance, things that felt high quality, things that felt low quality. 
Um, and so from that feedback, so we exceeded our goal um, faster than a month, um, didn't really did very little marketing, uh, just sort of tapped our networks and sort of had friends of friends just reach out to other people who thought this might be interesting. Um, and then that feedback was actually really valuable in helping us to sort of do version two of our clubs. We made some technical and aesthetic upgrades um, and then launched those in conjunction with our website uh, about, I'd say nine months later. So yeah, March of 2020 was when we fully launched the website. Hello. Yeah, Steph, wanna jump in? What's been your like di overall digital strategy since you started? I mean, where were you back in 2019? Where are you now? Where do you guys wanna go with it? Back in 2019, we had no marketing. Actually, we might've boosted a few posts to our friends for Kickstarter, if I can remember. Um, and then really when we hit the ground running last year, our initial thought was, okay, if we all have this collective Facebook and Instagram experience, let's start out there. We understand the platform. We have all collectively launched so many brands in our time at the company. We kind of know what that playbook looks like. So launched on Facebook and Instagram internally. So Andrew and I were running all of the ads, which is lovely. We knew a lot. It also got very overwhelming. So once we realized that that was actually fueling a lot of sales, we started thinking, okay, let's keep on this track. We should probably start expanding digitally as well. Um, what about Amazon from like a, not only a marketing perspective, but also like another place to carry the product perspective. And so we started broadening our horizon, knowing that you really have to be across all of digital to be a successful brand. And so, you know, about six months ago or so we decided to take the Facebook and Instagram out of our internal space, at least for now, and hire an agency called Levitate, which we are working with Steph on, um, which honestly has just been, it's given us a lot more bandwidth to start thinking about the larger strategy, um, while also just maintaining a pulse on Facebook and Instagram, but not having to be as in-depth in it. Peter is, I will tell you to the day he dies, gonna figure out how to use TikTok. He thinks that is like the next big thing. I'm not sold, but I am interested. Um, we're doing a lot of YouTube and just, just all over that digital landscape. And you know, one thing we're also very aware of is you also can't just be digital. So we are looking into some retail partnerships to make sure that we have this holistic marketing strategy that spans all the areas our consumers might be. What's your guys' take on Amazon and how does that come into play with overall D 2 C? Cause I, I mean, having worked with you guys, I kind of know the vision and where you guys want to go huge potential on D2C. How do you guys think about Amazon in the context of all of that? So I have to say, um, in the beginning, I was really nervous about Amazon. One of the things we're most excited about is controlling our brand narrative, which is incredibly important to us. And our mission is incredibly important to us. So it was really scary to think about going onto a platform where you give up all of that brand control. At the same time, we are saying we want to be the most accessible golf brand to allow anyone to get into the sport, which we actually have come to love. And so what we realized is to say that you also have to be in the places where a ton of those people shop which we all know is Amazon. You look at how many consumers they have on that platform and we would almost be doing ourselves a disservice by not looking into it and at least seeing what happened. So that's really why we got onto the platform. We're actually seeing tremendous success right now. We sold out of our clubs really quickly on the platform, hopefully back in stock next week, but we're really thinking about it as another way to provide accessibility in this golf ecosystem where Peter and I actually had a really, really hard time getting those beginner sets in our hands. Yeah, and, and one, one thing I'll add to that, I mean, when we were doing our research, uh, and you, if you dive into the 10Ks of the sort of the major public golf companies, the Cushnet and Callaway, they spend the vast majority, almost the entirety of their marketing budget on these very traditional legacy channels. So on TV, on print and on player endorsements. And so for us, um, you know, to Ali's point, just trying to create more accessibility in the sport, there's a lot of opportunity on digital. So most of these big co club companies sell clubs individually. Not many are doing them in sets and not many of them are doing it on Amazon or through D2C or using platforms like Facebook, Instagram, search as sort of uh, marketing channels. So for us, it feels like there's a lot of, there's a lot of space there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you guys absolutely nailed it in finding the perfect product, the next like D2C product. It could, I mean, the variables all line up perfectly, right? This, this is how the last decade of D2C came about, right? It's like companies finding products to innovate on, 
um, within that D2C channel, cut out the middleman, et cetera, et cetera. This could have been, I mean, couldn't have been, you know, a better product. So it's, it's fantastic. Knowing that you guys started with beginner friendly products versus the industry incumbents you just talked about that focus purely on performance. How does that strategy change over time? Will you always focus on the beginner sets? Is there, is there a, a market for more advanced? How do you guys think about that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a question that we get a lot. Uh, and so th there's sort of two parts to that, right? The beginner casual market by number of people is actually much larger than the avid golfer community. So there's about 34 million golfers in the US, people who've played golf um, on a course or in a driving range before. Of that, about 27 million of those are sort of the casual player, people who play, you know, just for fun or are getting into it. Um, and the remainder sort of 7 million are people who would be considered avid golfers, people who are playing multiple times a year, buying multiple pieces of equipment per year. Um, on top of that, there is an additional 15, and this number has actually grown tremendously over the past several years. Uh, there's 15 million people uh, who have expressed a strong interest in getting into golf, but just haven't for one reason or another. Our hypothesis is a lot of that has to do with the culture of golf, right? Culture, the golf has really been built on this sort of notion of exclusivity, right? People sort of think you have to be affluent, you have to belong to a country club, or more often than you, you, people feel like you already have to be a good player in order to get out there. So for us, a big part of Robin is sort of cracking open that narrative and changing it to make more people feel like they can play, like they can get into this game. And so we think there's just a ton of opportunity and a ton of runway specifically within that beginner casual market. Where we go beyond that is kind of interesting, right? So there's sort of opportunity to move either a little bit downstream more towards sort of the traditional discount uh, players or a little bit more upstream. And I think when we think about swimming upstream, we love to think about how we can use technology to sort of democratize that process, right? If you think about custom fitting, for example, which is sort of a, a sort of very popular way for golf companies to sort of um, get you to spend more money is, you know, you typically have to go to a range, you have to have a pro come with you, you take swings with a bunch of different equipment, usually just making an appointment costs like several hundred dollars. And then when you get custom fit, you know, that, you know, getting a custom fit set can easily run you, you know, several thousand dollars. Um, so for us, we start thinking about, well, how can we use technology to sort of democratize that process and make it more accessible? So anyway, then we think there's a long runway with beginner casual, but there's also ways we're sort of, we're thinking of just making golf more accessible on the lower end, on the upper end. Uh, that makes sense. I, I, I'm curious specifically during the launch phase, I, I was just looking, I think it was Fast Company or Forbes that you had a great, uh, great launch article with. Um, I'm curious in that like month span when you were launching, I remember seeing you guys everywhere. Um, what, reflecting back, what mistakes did you make or that you would like go back and immediately redo again? Um, well, I will say the first thing we thought when we launched in the middle of COVID was, well, they say that launching a company is half luck and this one was really unlucky. So we're just going to write this one off. Great job thinking of the company and like, we'll try again next time. We really had no idea what was going to happen because at that point, no one was buying anything. Everyone was really, really scared. The economy was really in this, in this interesting position. And so the first month was just there weren't even mistakes to be thinking of. It was like, I think this company isn't going to make it. Then when April and May started hitting and, and golf became this COVID approved sport and it started taking off, that's when we actually started making decisions. Some of which we look back on now and we're like, okay, we understand why people invest in repeat founders because they probably learn these things and then they don't do them the next time, but that's just good to keep in our brain. Um, so I think some, there were a few really big ones for us. One is we hired an amazing PR company. They were like the best partners to us. They hit the ground running and literally went to every single publication possible. One of which you saw was Forbes. But what we realized is we were so early and we were really trying to go into a different direction. We didn't want to be in golf publications. We actually wanted to be more in lifestyle and business publications because we didn't want to be a golf brand. And I think we did ourselves a disservice there because since we were trying to hit so hard on lifestyle, it was actually much harder to get awareness, to get press and to have people recognize us as a brand because you have to be a little more established to then go to a Vogue and say, Hey, do you want to pick us up versus going to a golf digest and say, Hey, we're a new golf brand. So I think that was one of our early 
mistakes that we will learn from in the future. Um, I think the second one, I'll let Pete jump in because I'm sure he has a bunch too, was just the amount of inventory we ordered on some things really, uh, we missed the mark there, but everyone told us that's like the number one thing as a founder that you're going to miss the mark on. Um, we were like, maybe it could not be us, but it was a hundred percent us. We made a lot of mistakes around inventory numbers and that's something we are still working to, um, correct to this day. Pete, do you have any more you want to add? No, I think th those are the big ones. I have, a, I mean, I think we're probably going to get into fundraising in a little bit and we have, well, we probably have some more specific fundraising mistakes once we get to that topic. Um, yeah, no, we can definitely dive in there. I mean, I, I'm curious less about the process specifically, but more about the characteristics or you know, like person to person qualities that you're looking for in people on your cap table. Um, after the Kickstarter, how have you gone about that process? I'm sure it's similar, just like people you want to work with in general. Yeah, no, ex exactly. So, I mean, you kind of touched on it. I mean, fundraising for us was not just about the money that we were raising, but also about the sort of the quality of the partners that you bring on, right? And so early on, right, like all money is not equal, right? And I think we learned that the hard way in some cases, right, where if somebody is willing to write you a check, you think immediately, great, that's a lot of money in the bank. But then you, when you sort of learn more about the people that you want to collaborate with, you really want to have take money from people who will support you, who will collaborate with you, who you know, see your mission and support that. And that's not always the case. And so we've definitely gone into some, you know, some uh, instances while we were raising money where we got really excited about a check and then ultimately realized that, you know, the, I guess the culture fit wasn't there. And, you know, we, we, we really believe that culture fit with your investors is just as important as culture fit with the people that you have on your team. Um, so that was a, that was a big learning curve, I think, during, during the fundraising process. Um, so, but now we've got a really amazing cap table. We've got a ton of really great sort of partners who are not only part of the golf industry, but also just incredible entrepreneurs, incredible investors. I will say the one difficult thing, one of the most difficult things is it was very important for us, uh, to have a diverse cap table. That's been something that's been really difficult for us to achieve. Got it. That makes sense. Um, on that point about, you know, whether it's celebrating people on your cap table and kind of like moving into the future. Um, what are some of the big wins, I guess, over, I know you guys haven't been around too long, but over the past three to six months that, that you're really hyped about and then any, you know, exciting expansion plans that you have coming up for the next couple quarters. Yeah, I think we both probably have, I'll say one P and then you could say one. So I think the one I have been most excited about is if you look at um, the golf industry and sales about, you know, less than 5% of sales come from women and kids. We have more than 50% of our sales coming from women and kids, which for me in particular, I am just incredibly excited about because that's the demographic where I felt so underserved. So that's been a major win that also really shows that our mission is sticking and we are not just a golf company. We're also a company who cares about inclusivity and diversity. So that's probably my number one of this past year, but Pete, I'll let you highlight one as well. Yeah. I mean, and, and just to add on to that, I mean, the average age of the U S golfer is 55 years old and 80% of our customers are under the age of 35. So, you know, when we, when we first started, you know, our biggest detractors were people in the golf industry, right? They say, Oh, you know, women won't play golf. Oh, people won't buy sets, you know, this, it, it, a lot of really just derogatory stuff, homophobic comments, sexist comments. I mean, there's a whole thread on this form about, how it's a terrible idea. There's, I mean, just a ton of really blatantly sexist comments. Um, and so for us, yeah, it's, it's been incredibly validating that um, our customers are, are young and diverse. And I think what really excites us is about being able to create this ecosystem for a new kind of player, a younger, more diverse player that could theoretically be with us for, for many years to come. Um, other exciting developments, let's see, uh, we successfully, rate of, I guess we successfully completed our seed round. Uh, we raised about 1.2 million uh, as of a couple weeks ago, um, a mix between equity and debt, which we're really excited about. Um, that'll sort of just allow us to, to grow our products, reach more people, diversify our marketing, bring on some, uh, bring on some new hires. And I think the other thing is uh, we're now, uh, we're working on getting balls to market, which will hopefully be done by what, Al? Maybe the end of the summer, if things go our way? Fingers yeah. crossed. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I think when you, you know, you just mentioned Adrian, like what, like what's to come, what does the future hold? So balls are our next big thing. Peter and I are convinced that balls can be fun right now. It's like, just go get your set of balls. And you know, I lose all of my balls because I'm a terrible golfer, but I want to have fun balls that I lose. Like I don't just want boring balls that I lose. So that's our next next adventure and then um near and dear to my heart as well is you know you men have wonderful apparel choices to walk out onto the course with you could get everything from preppy to sporty to hipster um women just don't have the same options which i think is one of the reasons too why they don't walk out on the course because everyone says looking good is half the battle whether you're skiing playing golf whatever it is and i rarely walk onto a course feeling great or feeling like myself. So really looking to expand into apparel as well as our next big thing to really make sure people feel like the best version of themselves when they walk onto the course. I love it. I love it. This is a perfect place to close off. I think it's so easy to and accessible for young people to get into golf. Like that was the first thing I said to you when I met you guys. So I'm so excited for your growth. It's I'm, I can literally feel it. It's I'm so excited. So amazing guys. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys having on, um, coming on. I'm sorry. Uh, we can close up here. I'm sure we can keep talking for hours, but we'll get you on for a round two in a couple of weeks. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Thank you, guys. No, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us on. It was great speaking with you guys. Well, uh, we'll Steph, we'll obviously chat. You can see we chat all the time. So, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you guys. Uh, talk to you guys later. Amazing. See you, Peter. See you, Ali. Yeah. See you.